history unfolding at the Texas Capitol. We knew that the Attorney General was already in legal trouble. We didn't realize he was in so much political trouble. The impeachment trial of Ken Paxton. The political theater must come to an end. The other man at the center of the allegations, the potential conflicts of interest, and whether Paxton will take the stand in his own defense. This was a sham. It was a sham from the get-go. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event, but this isn't Texas's first impeachment. A look back at the last time Texas impeached a statewide official. So they think inherently there cannot be a fair trial. Tonight, we're answering your question about the historic impeachment trial of Ken Paxton. In four days, Texas will witness history in real time. Attorney General Ken Paxton will stand trial on Tuesday for 20 articles of impeachment alleging abuse of office. Now his fate and whether or not he keeps his job as Attorney General rests with the Texas Senate, who will act as the jury in the Court of Impeachment. The Senate chamber, now a courtroom, with new furniture in place, including a witness stand, where Paxton could be called to testify under oath and explained the allegations. My co-host this evening is Michael Atkinson, our legislative reporter, who watched these historic proceedings unfold from the start. They'll be covering the Senate trial beginning Tuesday. And Michael? there's a good chance, Walt, that we're going to see something of a political spectacle next week with a dramatic climax to this impeachment trial. Attorney General Ken Paxton is the first statewide elected official in more than a century to be impeached in Texas. Back in May, the Texas House voted along significant margins to impeach Paxton. Across 20 articles of impeachment, Paxton is accused of using the power of his office for the benefit of himself and his allies, bribery, obstructing justice, lying on official records, among other things. Paxton has denied any wrongdoing. By all measures, May 23rd began as a normal day. But by the end of the day, the chips were falling into place for something extraordinary. That afternoon, seemingly out of the blue, Ken Paxton, Texas Attorney General, called on House Speaker Dade Phelan to resign. But in just a matter of hours, the tables had turned. The burner phones, the aliases, the payoffs, all of that says, okay, this is somebody who has done a lot of things that an attorney general, the highest legal official in the state, shouldn't be doing. The next morning, a dramatic twist as the House General Investigating Committee revealed a months-long investigation conducted behind closed doors into Paxton. Did you just state, I want to be very clear, that... The attorney general for the state of Texas said he did not want to use his office to help law enforcement. That is exactly what was relayed to us. Two days later, the committee introduced articles of impeachment against him. And by the end of the week, with a packed House gallery in a rare Saturday session, should the speaker voting aye, Paxton was impeached and constitutionally suspended from his job by a sweeping vote of 121 to 23. Paxton earlier that week denouncing the turn of events. The corrupt politicians in the Texas House are demonstrating that blind loyalty to Speaker Dade Phelan is more important than upholding their oath of office. Since then, each of the sides have enlisted high-profile attorneys to try this case. Tony Busby will defend Paxton, and Dick DeGuerin and Rusty Hardin will prosecute him. There are 20 articles of impeachment against Paxton, largely surrounding his relationship with Austin real estate developer Nate Paul. All roads lead to Nate Paul. They allege Paxton did things like unnecessarily intervene in lawsuits involving Paul, accepted bribes and gifts from him, and used his office to personally help Paul when he was in legal trouble. When staffers in Paxton's office brought those allegations to law enforcement in October 2020, several left their jobs or, in some cases, were fired. Four of them sued Paxton, which resulted in a $3.3 million settlement. Paxton, though, requested that the legislature use taxpayer funds to pay for that settlement, at which point the House committee quietly began looking into the claims of the settlement, which culminated in Paxton's impeachment. Mr. Paxton brought this matter to us. Let me repeat that. Mr. Paxton brought this matter to us. While this is all unfolding, the man at the center of Attorney General Ken Paxton's impeachment trial is Nate Paul, facing his own legal troubles. And while just earlier this summer, Paul was federally indicted on eight felony counts of making false statements to creditors and money lenders. His court case has been delayed until next summer, and the U.S. government is seeking $172 million in restitution. Ken Paxton is never mentioned in those charges, but Nate Paul is mentioned several times in Paxton's 
articles of impeachment. And you're probably going to hear Nate Paul's name several times during this impeachment trial about that relationship between Paul and Paxton. Now I want to talk about a few players in this trial. First, let's start with Brian Hughes, who represents Mineola and is one of the most prominent Republicans in the Texas Senate. Back during the pandemic in 2020, Nate Paul was facing bankruptcy. The House investigators alleged that Ken Paxton asked Brian Hughes to request legal clarification on whether or not a foreclosure sale could happen with pandemic restrictions on gatherings in place. Hughes made that request and Paxton allegedly had his team put out an opinion within two days saying foreclosure sales could not proceed with COVID restrictions. Hughes allegedly did not know the details of the request with investigators labeling him a straw requester and he will be allowed to vote in Paxton's impeachment. Someone who won't be voting in Paxton's impeachment, his own wife, Senator Angela Paxton. As a senator, she is a part of the court of impeachment, but under the trial rules, which were approved back in June, she is expressly forbidden from voting in this impeachment trial, given the obvious conflict of interest. But conflicts of interest are all but inevitable in a political trial like this, including with Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who under the Texas Constitution will serve as a judge in this trial. According to recent campaign finance records, Patrick received a sum of three million dollars in donations from a group that has publicly defended Paxton and called the impeachment process a sham. But just ahead of the trial, he has announced that he won't be accepting campaign donations during the trial. So what do we know about witnesses in this trial? While well, both sides were obligated to come up with witness lists of individuals that could be called up to testify, those lists are confidential. But the Dallas Morning News reports that sources have told them the House prosecutors plan to call up Paxton to take the stand. The outlet also reports that Nate Paul could take the stand as well as Laura Olson, the woman with whom Paxton allegedly had an affair. Meanwhile, the attorney general's team say they plan to call up Angela Paxton and Brian Hughes, but it's not clear they'll be able to testify given that they are both members of the court of impeachment and both sides have reportedly said they want to call up the group of whistleblowers that had originally sued Paxton. Meanwhile, Ken Paxton is also facing a criminal trial. We'll explain the backstory and how it plays into this trial. And we're sitting down with more Texas political experts. We'll answer your impeachment questions coming up. Attorney General Ken Paxton has been the state's top law enforcement officer for three terms now, but he's had legal battles stretching back all the way to his first term. And for nearly that entire eight year stretch, Paxton has avoided sitting in court over securities fraud charges. But that changed in August when the attorney general made a court appearance. Before he appears in the court of impeachment, Ken Paxton appeared before a criminal court in Houston at the beginning of August for a case dating back to 2015. Attorneys met in a criminal case alleging Paxton solicited investors to a company without telling them he was being paid by the company. It's just time, enough so enough. And uh, Paxton obviously has the time now to deal with it. This case is unrelated to the impeachment to an extent, but attorneys agreed to wait until October to make more decisions in the case. Logically, if he's impeached in the Senate, he would have greater motivation to resolve this case on whatever basis because his political career, one would think, would be dead. Now lawyers will come back to Houston on October 6th, possibly to set a trial date. While that's happening, the U.S. Department of Justice is investigating Paxton over his relationship with Nate Paul, just as he was impeached for by the Texas House. Impeachments may be rare, but they're not unprecedented. After the break, we'll look at the last time Texas impeached a top elected official and how he fared in his trial. There's one group of people we haven't heard much from about the impeachment trial of Ken Paxton. That's the legislature itself. That's because a gag order put in place by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, which forbids senators from sharing their opinions. A memo we obtained reveals that gag order also includes the House of Representatives and all the lawyers involved. So instead of statements and press conferences, attorneys have let this legal battle play out in court filings. Even then, they've often towed the line, particularly Paxton's team, who have seemingly found a workaround by putting out press releases quoting entirely from court documents. It's kind of getting close to violating the gag order, but because it's part of the legal process, it doesn't reach that. 
The gag order is in place until the end of the trial. As unprecedented as this trial may be, this isn't the first Texas impeachment. It's happened twice before. In 1975, a judge was impeached and convicted, but Attorney General Ken Paxton is the highest level Texas official in more than a century. Tonight, we want to take you back to 1917 when Texas impeached and convicted its governor. To get a grasp on how the impeachment trial will work next week, it may be helpful to turn to the past, 106 years in the past to be specific. That's the last time Texas impeached and convicted a statewide elected official. James E. Ferguson, who was called Pa Ferguson, uh, was governor of Texas. He was elected in 1914. Don Carlton is the executive director of the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas. And he was very, very popular in rural Texas, not so much in urban Texas. There were several uh, faculty members at the University of Texas uh, at Austin who went out and campaigned against him. Uh, and he was the kind of guy who took names, uh, and so he demanded that they be fired. He was so angry at the university and the university's refusal to fire these faculty members that he literally vetoed the entire university budget. That's what led to the Texas House convening and then uh, impeaching him on several counts. Ultimately, he was convicted by the Senate too, but Ferguson resigned a day before that vote came, leading to a constitutional question of whether or not he could run for office again. After the courts ruled he couldn't, Ferguson's wife, Miriam Ma Ferguson, ran for governor and won seven years later. And between the political spouses, the populist popularity, and the high-profile trial, the Ferguson trial sometimes feels closely similar to how Paxton's impeachment unfolded. Now, the old saying is history doesn't repeat itself, but uh, it comes pretty close. No less so, given that Ferguson's trial has largely served as a template for senators on how to proceed with Paxton's trial. It's that part of it that has led to the description of this process, even though it looks like a legal judicial process as an inherently political process. After the break, we'll sit down with Texas political experts for what to expect next week. Joining us now to discuss Ken Pax's impeachment trial, at the end, Dr. James Henson, the director of the Texas Politics Project at the University of Texas at Austin. And here, Zach Despart, political reporter for the Texas Tribune. Thanks for joining us. You know, this reads like a poolside novel, okay? <laughs> Some say Paxson's going to be a Teflon Don here. But let's start with the basics, Zach. What are the rules? Is this going to be like court TV? Is it different than what we know for traditional trials? Well, it will be televised, or at least live streamed, on the, the Senate's normal stream that it does, just like it does in the regular sessions. It will have the broad strokes of a criminal trial that people are familiar with. There will be a prosecution, that is the House impeachment managers who are making their case against the Attorney General. The Attorney General has his own legal team that's essentially the defense counsel. Um, the prosecution will go first, they'll get to make their case, they'll get to bring their witnesses, the defense will get to go make their case. At the end of the whole process, the jurors, which are the senators in this case, get to deliberate in private, decide how they're going to vote, and then deliver what is essentially the verdict here, whether they will uh, convict Attorney General Paxton on any of these 16 impeachment articles. But the jurors almost double, right? 31 instead of 12, or how many jurors are going to be there? So 31 are, senators? Yes, yeah, so there are 31 mem members of the Senate. Uh, here a little bit different, uh, Lieutenant uh, Governor Dan Patrick is essentially the judge in this case, so he would not vote uh, here. And also while uh, Mrs. Paxton, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Attorney General Paxton's wife is a senator, she is not allowed to actually vote in this case given her relationship to the defendant here. It requires a two-thirds vote to convict on the articles. It only requires a simple majority to dismiss articles. So it's a harder case for the, the prosecution. And to get a little bit further, this is not only a crucial moment for the attorney general, but for the senators who are going to cast their vote. Uh, Jim, I want to ask you a little bit about how that's going to impact this trial. Yeah, I'd say the jurors in this case are under you know a lot more pressure than we think of as a, as a regular juror. All of these senators are elected officials. Um, and I think in particular, the Republican senators are feeling a lot of pressure. They're feeling pressure from, in particular, interest groups that are mobilized in defense of, uh, you know, the, the resigned or, or uh, suspended Attorney General Paxton. Um, and I, I think there's a real appetite among those senators to take the temperature of both their colleagues and the public 
to try to figure out what they should do. But it, it's that part of it that has led to the description of this process, even though it looks like a legal judicial process as an inherently political process. All right, so just in short, quick little answer, what role is the, uh, what are we going to see from interest groups? What pressure are they putting on these senators? Well, I think we're seeing polling done in individual senators' districts. We've seen text messages sent to, to voters and to other players in the system. We're seeing fundraising appeals using uh, the prosecution of the, of the, uh, the attorney general as a as kind of a lever to put pressure and more you know more important than anything the threat of primary opponents nothing scares a, a an elected official in the legislature like having to actually run against an opponent right after the break we're going to ask what to expect at the start of next week's impeachment trial I look forward to a quick resolution of the Texas Senate, where I truly believe the, the process will be fair and just. Jim Henson with the Texas Politics Project. Can we expect a quick, fair and just Senate trial? Well, that's, that's three questions, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think quick is looking a little less likely based on just what we're hearing from inside the Senate. Um, you know, fair and just, right now, both sides seem to be relatively comfortable with the rules as written, but I think it's really going to be how it unfolds, and, and the key factor here is going to be how Lieutenant, Dan, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick handles this. Uh, as Zach said, he's the judge, he's presiding over the trial, but like everything else he's involved in, he will be exerting a lot of force in the process. Zach, same question to you. Yeah, it depends on who you ask. Uh, there are many Republicans who felt like the impeachment investigation and vote in the House was, was rushed, was flawed, so they think inherently there cannot be a fair trial in the Senate based on that. Uh, Attorney General Paxton, in his comments, expecting a fair trial, uh, you know, he has an interest in not angering the people that are going to vote on his fate, right? So he has to walk a, a pretty fine line. Uh, there are certainly people in Paxton's camp, though, uh, that feel like uh, they need to put the pressure on to those Republican senators who have the most say in the outcome here. There are going to be fireworks for sure. Thank you both for joining us. And thank you for joining our conversation with James Henson and Zach Despart. You can head to the homepage of our website for more. We'll be keeping a close eye on what unfolds in these coming days. You've been watching the impeachment trial of Ken Paxton, a Sinclair News special. I'm Walt McAborski, joined by legislative reporter Michael Atkinson.